this is Senate Finance, and this is February 10th. And we are going to walk through a draft that for a committee bill uh, for anything we choose to do with the waiting study. And Senator Hardy, do you want to give us just a brief walk through of I know this was your you you've been handling the drafting of this. So just tell us what's happening and we'll go through it. Okay. Um, well, Jim has been handling the actual drafting, but I've been working closely with him. And um, the bill that we'll walk through, it is long. It's a complicated bill. Um, and it includes um, uh, the goals of the whole thing, uh, uh, the whole um, change to our school finance um, formula and uh, system. Um, it includes um, uh, provisions to change the weights. So in the bill, the assumption is that we would uh, go with the weights for the four categories um, of uh, po the poverty, students living in poverty, students um, who are in small schools of two kinds, students who are in um, uh, population density rural areas and um, uh, grade level weights. It does not have anything at this point about ELL um, that we're still waiting from Senate for sen from Senate education, um, but it has the weights for the other four categories. We could certainly change to the cost equity formula, but that's what is in there now. It also includes um, some transition provisions that I mentioned yesterday about rolling in um, the, the changes in weights by averaging the equalized pupils. It includes um, uh, uh, an audit and an evaluation, which is based on the proposal that Senator Brock um, made to the task force, um, and it's fleshed out a little bit more. And it includes the creation of an education fund advisory committee, which um, was recommended by the ta uh, the tax commission, um, and also the um, pupil waiting task force, um, and it has some provisions related to that. And it also provides additional staff to the agency of education so the one thing it does do in ell is two staff for ell um, support and then two staff for um, education quality standards and two for finance so those are the main provisions and jim will go through all the details but a lot of this is based on the recommendations of the pupil waiting task force so that's sort of what i had jim draft as a starting point right so this is the initial draft from based just about entirely on the, the waiting and on the study recommendations. And Jim will walk us through it and then it will be our turn. So Jim, why don't you start and um, welcome to Senate Finance. And Jim and I started down in Ed together. We did. And did a steep <laughs> learning curve. <laughs> for me, for sure. Oh, for me too. Uh, so thank you, uh, um, Sir Cummings. Uh, do you prefer to have the document on screen or, or not? Yeah, it's probably easiest to do it that way. Okay, so Faith, I'm not sure if I have that capacity. Let's see. I do, great. Um, and it's right here. Okay, so um, for the record, um, Jim Damory led console. We are walking through this initial draft of a committee bill. Um, and I won't go through the statement of purpose. I think Senator Hardy did an excellent job uh, bringing out the main points. Um, so there are four points brought out here, uh, just high level uh, around the changes to weight around the creation of this new advisory committee, uh, the new positions at AOE, and the requirement to have an audit reformed. Um, there's more in the bill than that, but those are some of the main parts. Um, so coming down to the findings and goals, I won't go through these in detail. I'll just summarize what's in these subsections. So we start with Brigham and the uh, right to uh, equal, um, uh, su su substantial uh, uh, 
um, equality and educational opportunity. Then we go into um, um, kind of a Vermont perspective on, on uh, trying to achieve that. Uh, and then we talk about learning differences in students uh, coming from different backgrounds and, um, and therefore needing different le levels of support. And then D goes into um, talking about Act 173 and the waiting study that UVM and Rutgers did. And then E goes into um, that report that they delivered and its findings. Um, F goes into uh, Act 59 from last session, which created the task force that met over the summer and their recommendations. Um, and that's it. So that, those are the findings and a high level. Uh, the goals here, there are five goals, and these goals are the same goals that would be tested against during the audit. Um, so um, I'm going to read through these because these I think are important. Um, so it says, by enacting this legislation, the, the GA intends to fulfill Vermont's constitutional mandate to ensure that all students receive substantial equality of educational opportunity throughout the state. Uh, the legislation is designed to, one, increase educational equity by ensuring that the financial resources available to the local school districts for educating students living in poverty, students with English language learning needs, students in, in small rural communities, students in sparsely populated school districts, and students in middle and high schools are su sufficient to meet the cost of educating these students. Two, uh, improve educational outcomes uh, for these students by ensuring uh, that financial resources tied to the cost of educating these students are available to local school districts. Three, improve transparency in the distribution of financial resources to school districts by simplifying the school funding formula and better tying educational expenditures to student needs. Four, enhance educational and financial accountability by ensuring that equitable resources are budgeted and expended for the education of students in these circumstances or categories and that regular evaluation mechanism, mechanisms I'm sorry, are utilized to assess educational equity and outcomes. And lastly, improve oversight of Vermont's K-12 public education funding system by creating the new advisory body. So those are the five goals. Then we go into uh, the determination of weighted membership, um, kind of the heart and soul of this bill. It begins with a very technical change to the definition of long-term membership. I'll come back to that definition, um, but this is just merely clarifying that it's an average of two years enrollment basically, and it's the, the um, current school year and the previous school year. So just, just clarifying which two years are, are used for, for that purpose. Um, and then um, we have section four, um, there's a couple of things. So um, this changes the way in which um, uh, pupils from economically dep deprived backgrounds are identified. Um, so um, now it me means um, that people from an econom not economically deprived background means that people who um, is eligible for free or reduced price lunch under the National School Lunch Act um, and the Child Nutrition Act. It also takes out in the past, uh, English language le learners were counted in poverty for purposes of the poverty weighting. And this changes that to take that out. So ELL would be dealt with on its own, not through um, adding that into the poverty um, weight. Um, then section five is a piece of session law and it's relating to the previous session around how you determine whether students are from economically deprived backgrounds. Uh, and this says it's the intention of the General Assembly that this determination be changed from what you just changed it to, which is free or reduced price school meals 
to a measurement determined by the General Assembly, uh, but not lower than 185% of the 2021 federal poverty level with data collected from a universal income declaration form. And this goes on to explain that that form is used by various states and some school districts in Vermont um, uh, to collect household size and income information uh, and that um, it reduces stigma um, and, uh, and, and is a more accurate um, collection of information um, and requires the agency to convene a working group um, to develop a new form um, with input from school staff and hunger and nutrition experts. And that would have to be in place for the 23-24 school year. Okay, now we get into the very long and complex section on how weighted membership is determined. So before we go through this section, I just want to spend a minute, if I could, framing the process, because I, I know you've heard this from Brad James and others, but it's complicated. So um, this basically works as a recipe, um, a very complex recipe, um, and it's very step-based as we go through it. But let me just say at the beginning, just to outline the broad process, um, it starts with, um, uh, with current enrollment. So every year, um, enrollment is measured in schools um, at the beginning of the year. It's called average daily membership, and it's a measure of enrollment. And um, so what happens then is that you average that uh, average daily membership or enrollment over two years. Um, and we just saw that definition earlier. Um, so we now have something called long-term membership. So long-term membership is simply two years worth of enrollment averaged, okay? That long-term membership, that, that figure is then weighted. So now we're adding weights to that figure. Um, and there are a number of steps to do that. Um, and then, um, we, then the equal, equalization ratio is applied, which is very confusing, uh, but I'll explain. And then you come out to your equalized pupils, which is the driver, of course, for your tax rates. So just very broadly, let's, by way of example, let's assume a school district has long-term membership of 900 students. That's the average for two years of enrollment. Uh, they do their weights, and when they're all done their weights, they have then weighted long-term membership of 1,000. So they gained 100 students through the weights. Then after that, the equalization ratio is applied. And what that ratio is, it's a statewide enrollment. So let's say we have 78,000 students statewide. Then, um, then you, you divide that figure by the statewide weighted enrollment. So you combine all the weights across all districts. So let's say there's 78,000 students, but the weighted statewide um, is 85,000. So you take 78,000 divided by 85,000 and you come to 0.92. So what happens with the equalization ratio is the school district, in my example, had 900 students, but 1,000 weighted students the thousand ways of students would be multiplied by 0.92, and therefore the school district would have 920 um, equalized um, pupils. Um, and it's the equalization ratio that, that causes um, the system to, you can only gain weights by other districts losing weights. It's a zero sum game. And that's the effect of that equalization ratio. So I know that's confusing, but I just wanted to give a high level of how the process works. And then we'll go through it in detail. So the first part of the process is uh, the determination of average daily membership, average daily membership and subgroup lists. So this says that on before the first day of December during each school year, the secretary shall determine the average daily membership um, as defined of each school district for the current school year. Um, so that's the current enrollment figure basically so far. Uh, the determination shall, shall list separately because these categories will be weighted so they have to be identified first. Uh, they're gonna list separately resident pupils in pre-K, 
uh, resident pupils in K through grade five, uh, resident pupils in grade six through grade eight, and resident pupils in grades nine through 12. Uh, and then uh, on or before the first day of December during each school year, the secretary shall identify resident pupils from economically deprived backgrounds as defined, we went to the definition earlier, um, in each school district for the current school year. And then uh, on before that day again, the secretary shall list all school districts that have a population density measured by the number of persons per square mile residing within the geographic boundaries of the district as of July 1 of that year, equaling uh, fewer than 36 persons per square mile, or 36 to 54 persons per square mile, or 55 to 100 persons per square mile. Population density data shall be based on the most recent U.S. Census data as provided for the Agency of Education by the Vermont Center for Geographic Information. Um, and then again, by that same date, the first day of December, uh, Secretary shall list all school districts that have one or more schools that have an average two-year enrollment of uh, fewer than 100 pu enrolled pupils or 100 to 250 enrolled pupils. And then there's a certain way um, that enrollment is counted uh, in terms of the um, uh, small schools. And uh, it's, it's here, it's very technical. Uh, it means the average enrollment of the two most recent, recently completed school years and, and means the number of people who are enrolled uh, in a school operated by the district on October 1st and a pupil should be counted as one whether the pupil is enrolled as a full-time or part-time student. That's very confusing, but that is how the, it works now for small school grants. Um, so it's carry over from that, and it's how Brad James computes this. So uh, that's why this is here. Okay, so to lay the groundwork again. So, so far we've identified average daily membership, and we sorted it into all these categories that we're gonna need to weight and now, second step of the process is the, is the determination of long-term membership. And again, that is just a two-year average of average daily membership. Um, so um, the secretary shall determine long-term membership for each school district, for each pupil group described ab above. So pupil groups, again, are the ones we talked about in terms of like um, uh, pre-K and um, et cetera, all those different um, groups. The third step is to determine weighted long-term memberships. So now we're applying the weights to long-term membership. So we're applying weights to the two-year average enrollment. Um, the secretary shall determine the weighted long-term membership uh, for each school district. Um, and there are a number of steps here. So first, the secretary shall first apply grade level weights each pupil included in long-term membership um, shall count as one, um, multiplied by the following amount. So this will be a little confusing because we have a negative, but so the way this is gonna work in the end is you, we're gonna accumulate all these weights and then add the cumulative weights to the count of one, okay? Um, so uh, it's a cumulative process and you're adding weights to a count of one. So it would be one plus something. Um, except that we have a negative weight, which is um, we have a negative weight of 0 0.54 because the weight for pre-K student is 0.46. And under this me methodology, you have to subtract this uh, to get to that 0.46. So that's a little confusing, but that's how that works. Um, and then grades six through eight, much more straightforward, you have a, uh, a weight of 0.36. Um, so for example, if you're a student in grade six, you, from this you have a weight so far of 1.36. Um, um, and then uh, grades nine through 12, you have a weight of 0.39. Then, so that applies to grade level weights. Now we're going, going to move to weights for the economically deprived background students. So um, each people include in long-term membership 
Uh, so it's even an additional weight of 1.03. So if you're from um, uh, economically defined background, you're getting an additional weight of 1.03 in addition to your count of one. Um, and then third, uh, the secretary so then apply the weight for pe people living in low population density school districts. So each people included in launch of membership um, residing in a low population density school district shall receive an additional weighting amount of uh, 0.15 where the number of persons per square mile in the school district is 35 or fewer and 0.12 uh, where the number of persons per square mile in the school district is 36 or more, but fewer than 56, or, or um, 0.07, where the number of persons per square mile in the school district is 56 or more, but fewer than 101. And then lastly, the secretary will, will apply a weight for pupils who attend a small school. Uh, that is conditional though. So, if the number of persons per square mile in a school district is 55 or fewer, and the school district has, has a small school, they'll get this, this weight, but you have to meet both conditions. You have to be um, in a, a, a sparsely populated school district as well. Um, and that weight is, um, if there are fewer than 100 pupils, then the school district receives an additional weighting amount of point. Um, two one for each pupil included in the small school's average two year enrollment, or um, if it's a hundred or more but fewer than two hundred and fifty one pupils, then it's an additional weight of point oh seven uh, of those school of those students enrolled in the small school. Um, and then five says uh, a school district's weighted long term membership shall equal long term membership. Um, um, plus the accumulation of the weights assigned by the secretary under the subsection. So this is five is where we're saying all of this stuff accumulates. So you have a count of one because um, you've got um, long-term membership will be your count of one for each student. And then you accumulate all of those weights and you have one minus weight for the um, pre-K where everything else is a positive weight. Um, then we go to um, no change here. Uh, there's a hold harmless provision. So we did take out, out some language here. Um, but again, it's just taking out the old weighting uh, methodology. Um, for F is hold harmless. This is where you have a 3.5% hold harmless. So you have a decline of, of students year over year. Uh, you'll be protected, um, so your tax tax rate won't go up too much. Um, that stays, but you'll see later on that this is in, in the transitional provision. This uh, is suspended for five years during the transition. Um, and then, um, and then, lastly, H um, the secretary then determines equalized pupils, and again, that she does that, or, or the secretary does that, it is to um, take that weighted long-term membership of the school district and multiply it by the equalization ratio that I described, and that will get you to equalize pupils. Um, so that is, that is that section, which is very complicated. Let me pause there, maybe. I think you're down by the uh, golf course, by the carts. Michael, you're not muted. Should I continue, or I just wanted to give the committee a chance to raise questions, or no? Okay. Um, okay, so I'll continue. So 6A is, is, um, is a amendment to what we just went through, which is, um, and that's because um, this amendment takes effect in the future. Um, so you'll see there on that um, as a transitional mechanism um, for, for five years, um, equalized pupils is averaged. In the first couple of years, it's averaged over a five year period. Uh, and then it reduces to averaging over a two year period. Uh, so the transitional 
period has an average to, to smooth out the rolling in of these new weights. Uh, but once that process is over, I believe it's in 2028, um, this says that the going forward, the equalized people count will be the average uh, of the current year in the last two years. So it'll be a three-year average. So going forward today, uh, equalized people count was a one-year figure. And going forward after the transition, it will be a three-year average rather than a one-year figure. And that's what this, this does. Um, and then um, there is this section 6B called Perspective and Conditional Repeals, which is session law, which reads, if on before July 1, 2027, the General Assembly has not revised the weighing factors to reflect changes in cost factors from which the weights are derived, after receiving a recommendation of the new advisory committee uh, to do so, then um, the um, weighting section we just went through is repealed. Uh, and um, in that section 6A, which again is, is an amendment to the weighting section, is repealed. Um, so this is kind of, kind of a measure to um, encourage the General Assembly to take action in the future, either by adjusting the weights um, or, um, or not. But if they're not going to do that, they have to repeal this provision uh, in right here, 6B, so that, that the um, waiting section won't be repealed. So it's going to force some action in the future. I, 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 I Jim, is this similar to uh, if we do not set a yield, it used to be a tax rate, it reverted to the original tax rate and whatever the corresponding yield was of a dollar ten. Uh, well, I'm not sure because I'm not that close to the yield. But what this is similar to in my mind is uh, the education fund statute, which says that uh, there's permitted uses for the education fund, but the very last provision says that if if the fund is used for other purposes, the whole education tax system basically um, um, is. Right, so so this this is more similar, similar in that in terms of forcing a notwithstanding clause in that case. In this case, it will force um, uh, some action to be taken either by changing the weights or 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 repealing the section six. No, if so. we don't update the rates, then it reverts. All of this goes away and it reverts to the original weights? No, the weights go away entirely. So you, you have to do- There's no have, weighting, okay. Yeah. So you, you have to change, basically just take out 6B. So you could just repeal this, this, this section 6B and you'd be back to where you were. So it's either do the weights or repeal, okay. or, or, or repeal this, basically, so. Uh, and I assume we could, we would have to act if we wanted to continue the rates as as they are, uh, this would because this would yeah you have to act because otherwise if you didn't it would update go the away. weights it, it, the okay. whole thing would go away yeah, yeah we'd have to reauthorize all right yeah and Madam Chair if I may one of the reasons this is in here is because the the original weighting factors report by Professor Colby and her team recommended that the weights be updated every five years. Mm -hmm. at least every five years. And so this would be, if we enact this in 2022, 2027 would be five years. And so it sort yep. of forces a recalculation of the weights and could recalculate them to be the same thing or something different. So this is, that's why this is in here. Okay. okay. Any okay. other questions? I can't see anybody, so you have to holler. All right. Okay. All right. So now we're going into section seven. So now we're talking about merger support or what used to be called small school support. So what this does, now that, now that there is this um, small school weight, this repeals essentially the small school support statute, except that it turns it into a merger support um, statute because we do have merger support for those districts that, that voluntarily or involuntarily merged. Um, so it takes out the current language, but puts in, puts in a new language, which I'll come to. Um, 
voluntarily. So now it says that um, a school district that was voluntarily formed under Act 46, et cetera, um, and receives a merger support grant shall continue to receive that merger support grant subject to the provisions of subsection C. And what that will say is that if you get a weight, a small school weight, you don't get the merger support grant too. Um, okay. And then same thing here in B, if you were involuntarily, involuntarily merged or formed by the state board, again, you you get the um, the same same deal basically. So you're gonna get the merger support grant. Uh, um, it's the same, basically you're gonna take your small school grant that you had in fiscal 2020, and that will become a merger support grant going forward, the same amount, but you don't get that again if you get a small school weight, which is right here um, and C. Um, and then of course the, the merger support grants um, go, away, go away if the small school is closed. Uh, if the reason for getting that grant Change, changes um, because the small school closes, then you no longer get the, the grant. Um, and then there's just some technical changes here. Um, so we have section eight, eight around um, uh, DAS missions and corrections. And this is just taking out the reference to small school support since that's gone. Um, and again, another conforming change here. Um, talking about the small school weight adjustment rather than the small school grant. Um, so these are merely conforming. Um, now we go into the transitional uh, section, section 10. And so what this says is that for fiscal years 24, 25, 26, so the first three years, I believe, um, the number of equalized pupils in school districts should be determined by averaging the equalized people count for the year of calculation with equalized people counts for the preceding four fiscal years. So for these three years, you're taking a five-year average of your equalized people counts. Um, and then for the next year, you're taking um, a four-year average. Uh, and then for the next year, 28, you're taking a three-year average. And then after that, we went over earlier that you're amending the base statute to have a three-year average going forward um, after uh, fiscal year 28. Um, then uh, section 11 suspends the um, excess spending penalty for that same five-year period, the, the transitional period. And it also suspends a hold harmless provision that 3.5% hold harmless we talked about is also suspended during that five-year uh, transitional period. Um, the, section 12 is a piece of session law, which just says that the uh, Vermont Center for Geographic Information will work with the agency to help them determine number of persons per square mile. Um, and then we go into evaluation and report. So I'm gonna read through this section. Um, but not the goal, goals again, which are repeated here. Um, but it says, on or before December 15, 2029, the state auditor shall submit to the House and Senate Committees on Education, um, Ways and Means, um, Finance, uh, Agency of Education, and the, the new um, Education Tax Advisory Committee, a performance audit conducted under uh, GAP. Um, oh, go. Government accepted, generally, is that gap? <laughs> That's government. So um, that identifies the successes and failures of the implementation of this act, including including uh, whether and to what extent um, each of the act's five goals have been met, which are two. And this just repeats those five goals that we went through at the beginning. But this is the test what's being tested against. And then it says if a goal has not been met, the reasons why and recommendations to achieve that goal and the physical impact of the act, including the, the cost of implementation. And since the audit should be carried out by the state auditor or a contracted designee of the state auditor who, in order to maintain independent, independence, has not consulted on or contracted to provide services in relation to the people weighing factors report 
um, or the report prepared um, uh, under Act uh, 59. And the audit should cover the period beginning July 1, 2024 and ending on, on June 30, 2029. Um, and then the audit should take into account such metrics as the auditor determines appropriate, which shall include um, EQS, so how, how the school is doing on EQ, EQ, EQS, um, and looking at various metrics for that. Uh, student, student performance, progress on proficiency-based learn, learning assessments and graduation requirements. Uh, student performance on standardized tests. Um, the Vermont Youth Behavior Risk Surveys uh, uh, results. Uh, graduation and post-secondary education enrollment rates, education spending, homes and tax rates, um, educator compensation levels and for licensure status, and academic extracurricular and student support resources across school districts. Then we have the creation of this um, Education Fund Advisory Committee. Um, and the purpose is to monitor Vermont's education financing system, conduct analyses, recalculate and recalibrate the people weights and categorical aid amounts as necessary, and make annual recommendations, uh, reporting annual recommendations, um, and so report its findings to the General Assembly. Uh, membership should be seven members, um, Commissioner of Taxes, uh, Secretary of Education or designees, uh, two members of the public with expertise in education and financing, uh, appointed by the speaker, two members of the public with expertise in education and financing, appointed by the committee and committees, and one member of the public with expertise in education and financing, appointed by the governor. Uh, powers and duties um, are annually um, before June 15th of each year. Commission make recommendations to you regarding the recalculation and recalibration of people weights and categorical A as necessary, the proper the property do dollar equivalent yield, the income dollar equivalent yield, the non said property tax rate, and the amount of the stabilization reserve. Assistance is from um, various people or, or departments of taxes, AOE. GFO, Ledge Council, and um, Office of Ledge Operations, um, and then certain language around meetings, um, um, compensation, the standards of compensation as well. Um, and then um, it requires a first report of this committee by January 15th of, of next year. Um, and um, yeah, so that's basically it there. And then section 16 um, is a change to the tax title, uh, section uh, title 32. Um, and this um, changes existing law. And so now it will read um, annually, not later than December 1, the Education Fund Advisory Committee, rather than the Commissioner of Taxes, after consultation with the JFO, shall calculate and recommend a property dollar equivalent yield, income dollar equivalent yield, not homestead tax rate. Um, and then um, it also um, said that annually on before December 1, the committee with the assistance of JFO should prepare and publish um, um, the education fund outlook. Um, and those are the only changes to that section of tax law. Um, then we have the section that requires a collaboration by the agency in JFO. So it says that they will, uh, before August, August 1 uh, this year, enter into a, a memorandum of understanding to share data, models, and other information that's needed to update the weighting factors, host the statistical model used to provide modeling, and keep and maintain maintain that on both systems in parallel, uh, and then recommend, based on their consensus, consensus view, recalibrate weights to the Education Fund Advisory Committee. Um, then we come to staffing at the AOE. So 
and this creates six positions. Um, you have two positions uh, to provide uh, support for um, English language um, learners, uh, two for um, e uh, education quality standards uh, to support that, and two to support the new committee. The appropriation of 600,000 I put in as a guesstimate, uh, 100,000 per, I'm sure the agency would have views on, on that figure. Um, and um, then we come to technical and conforming changes. Um, and um, go, the task force realized over the summer that the excess spending uh, provision has some provisions that aren't, aren't used. So they're being taken out. Um, so, um, so when you're determining excess spending, you exclude various categories. Um, and so these are categories of exclusions that aren't being used. So number, the first one is spending attributable to the cost of planning the merger of a small school, um, which has a great size of 20 or fewer students. I don't think there are schools in the state like that anymore, or I think the agency doesn't believe that. So that's why that's being taken out. And then school district costs associated with dual enrollment, early college, um, those aren't paid by the school district, those are paid by the state. So uh, that sh well, shouldn't be here. Um, then um, we're, section 20, we're amending uh, equalized pupils. Um, this is just simply a technical change um, because you have to calculate equalized pupils in a given year, but then you, we're gonna be using a three-year average of that going forward. So I'm just clarifying that, um, that this definition is one that is used when you're calculating for any given year. Um, so that's the change there. And then um, this provision 20, section 21, is the power of school boards. Um, and so has this change here. Um, it's basically cross-referencing um, the, uh, uh, the, sorry, the weights um, again. Uh, so the new weighting language we've got. Um, and then we have effective dates. And these um, basically, the core of this bill takes effect if you will I'm going to skip down to B on July 1 of next year. That's all the weighting changes uh, that we're talking about. Um, so the ones coming to effect um, on passage or on you know, passage are the findings, the goals, the requirement to develop a universal income declaration form, um, the requirement uh, to uh, the new education advisory committee, et cetera. So you have a bunch of things that can affect on passage, things taking effect a year out. And then finally, um, that provision 6A uh, taking effect in uh, 2028. And that's the one that um, changes the def definition to use the three year average as opposed to one year. So that is the end of your walkthrough. Okay. Let me take this down so you can. Yeah, committee. Let me see. Okay, um, the one change I noticed that we hadn't talked about was having this committee do the, what's now called the November 1st letter with the recommended yields. Um, I wanna send that, well, send the whole bill out, I think, to the education department and to the tax department and joint fiscal. Um, for comment or feedback, uh, because that is a change. And that committee is set up to recommend weights every year. Director, um, every five years. Sorry, sure, sure. 
I'm looking for that provision. I want to make sure I get it right for you. Um, it back to us. It was right at the end. It talked yeah, about. It, are they are they assessing weights every year? The um, yeah, there's a report. Okay, you can get just. Yeah, let me. Yeah. yeah, let me check. I'm, I'm, yeah. yeah. Okay. I'll check. And this calculates everything is a weight. Is that correct? Correct. And we're leaving, uh, it, but the um, ELL weight is, we're still waiting, right? There's a big red square that we will plug Ed into. But we have not talked about one of the original thoughts was that we could do some as weights and some as grants outside of ELL. And what's concerning me, um, and I've got to do more research, is that I have an inner city that is losing, that is one of my lowest spenders, poorest districts, and one of my larger, not definitely wealthier than the inner city school is gaining. And a lot of it, and, and the difference is the sparsity weights. And I'm wondering how many other inner cities, because they are dense, are actually loot losing these are the places that thought they were going to win and i want to check on that but i'm wondering if we went to a because we are ready for rural schools we do they get a transportation grant now we're waiting them for poverty there's also a small school grant up to schools having 250 students which is not too small in vermont um so we've got three and I'm, I'm I've asked Professor Colby to come in and talk to us why we also need a rurality sparsity lack of density grant if we are covering for the cost of transportation and poverty and ELL and other things um, but it seems to be the density the, that's the weight that's working against the inner cities and I have I just haven't had time to sit down and go through all of Brad's printouts from yesterday but I asked about my two schools and it it was the density weight that threw them Senator Brock I would just amplify uh, what you said uh, in the discussion with uh, Professor Colby coming up as to whether the density rate, is a measure in itself or whether uh, it, the way it, 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 it appears in the ultimate statistics that she came up with, in effect, a measure of other factors of which density just happens to be commonality. For example, in rural districts, are rural districts uh, poorer? Are rural, rural districts have other factors that may have influenced this, uh, this particular weight or uh, the application of this weight and is rurality, rurality an equally valid measure of something that is meaningful, whereas poverty is much more clear cut. And I, I think it's worth exploring more in our questioning uh, of uh, yeah. Professor Colby, because it's something, frankly, that's concerned me uh, on, uh, as a member of the task force. So I, that's just one that I've, uh, I've picked up on, and I want to have a little more discussion because, and I finally figured out, um, I haven't heard much from my districts, but I have two superintendents that were appointed in the last two weeks, one as recently as last night. And I'm not sure, I know there's been some churning in the superintendency, there's been interims and I'm not sure where they are, but I don't think they, if they have a full-time superintendent now, it's not a very long term one. So I'm, but I know uh, that these are schools that thought they are so poor 
and they weren't when the weights got put in originally, that they were going to see something of a windfall and they are actually going to lose um, depending on where we, and lose 92 students, which is not a small amount. So um, that's just one of the things I want to look at, but we haven't, we've looked at weights, we've you know, decided we were leaning towards weights rather than the equity payments, but we haven't really looked at the interaction and, um, you know, if we might either not do something or do something as a grant, which would take it out of that whole waiting profile. So just a thought there but you might want to look at some if you've got any inner city i know i've looked at we looked at bennington i think i've looked at i wanted to look at st johnsbury st albans i think is probably transferred enough to it might it might still be impacted but some of those smaller denser communities um and then some of them have private academies that act as public schools. So that gets even more complicated. Okay, questions at this point. I'm starting to think there's a conspiracy to get a long break. Um, Senator Bray. Um, so I don't remember the sequence in terms of the factors used in the in the waiting study group. Um, I mean, did Professors Kolb, can, can you just remind me, did Professor Colby's report get drafted prior to your ever convening and then you're reviewing that? And so this whole rurality measure had already been introduced into the mix or was it something that evolved out of your committee conversations? Okay, that's a question for Senator Hardy, I assume. Yeah. So is that, do you want me to answer that, Senator? Please. Okay. Um, the, so the original pupil waiting factors report that was produced by Professor Colby and her team came out in December of 2019 and it and included a set of weights for the five categories under current discussion. So poverty, students living in poverty, um, students um, in different grade levels, middle school and high school, um, students in small schools and ELL students, and then students who lived in low population density areas. And the population density has three different levels of population density, and the small schools has two different levels of small schools. And those were all in Professor Colby's team's original report. Um, and she and her team uh, did a lot of statistical analysis based on 10 years, I think it was 2010 to 2019 cost data for school districts and schools uh, and regions, uh, the region, um, looking at that cost data and doing statistical analysis to determine how much more educating a student in various circum those various circumstances is cost cost to the same standard, and that standard was was uh, test scores. Um, so, to the quick answer to your question is yes, those were the original categories that Professor Colby's team um, proposed. We did not change those categories at all. We had a lot of discussions about them, as I've talked to Senator Cummings about, and, and Senator Brock can confirm or, or deny, I suppose, this, but we had a lot of conversations about whether or not we thought that all three of those rural categories were necessary and, and did transportation offset it. And, and Professor Colby can talk to that issue. She talked to us about it. Um, we had conversations about the different grade levels. Um, we had conversations about the different um, school sizes. And as, as Senator Cummings said, a lot of us were skeptical that a, that a 250 person school was small in the context of Vermont. But Professor Colby's data showed that there were differences in costs for these categories. Um, and I would assume that she would say that 
the other things were held constant. So poverty was held constant when looking at rurality, um, et cetera. But I can't speak for her. I'd rather have her explain it. But no. they, they are the thinking. same categories that were in the original report. And if I may, just to follow up. So costs, I mean, if the idea is to measure costs, then you would also want to know that you're getting the same outcomes for that cost, you know, like that the educational quality or whatever product is the same in each place so that the costs are also comparable. And, and so you're saying she normalized on test scores. That was the proxy for an equally valuable education. Her, yeah, her outcome, the, the outcome they used was math and English language, uh, uh, English test score, reading, math and reading test scores. Um, so they looked at the standardized tests um, for students uh, in each district and said, if, if this student got a, I'm going to make up levels, but a hundred, how, and they are this kind of student, how much more would it cost to educate this student to get up to the hundred? So that sort of differential was what was used to determine the weights. And this is a very oversimplification of it, but that's uh, how it is done sort of in the background. And so behind each weight is a cost factor. And those cost factors are actually what is the cost equity payments are those cost factors. Mm -hmm. So if you remember the chart that I gave all of you that had, these are the weights, these are the cost factors. Mm -hmm. Literally, that the the weight is that's the cost that's associated with that weight to educate that the same student up to an equitable standard. And I guess you could say the sort of like average student is a student in elementary school that doesn't doesn't is not impoverished does not go to a small school, does not live in a sparsely populated area, does not have English language learner needs. So that the one is the elementary school student in those circumstances. And so how much does it take to educate everyone else up to that same standard? Um, and knowing that educating middle schoolers and high schoolers is more expensive, namely because of the wider variety of classes and services that are necessary. Okay. But this is all based on the assumption that if I spent two point whatever, you know, if you've got the one and your weight is 1.24, that if I spent two twice as much, two, two and a half, two and a quarter times as much, I could educate that poor student to the wealthy student's level based Essentially, but, I mean, and I really, you know, Professor Cole, it's her research, so I yeah, don't want to. No, we'll, I, I think, yeah, we'll she, talk she about can that. Explain it. But we did have these conversations, and, you know, there was skepticism expressed um, um, and concerns and questions, um, you know, about some of the weights. And, um, and ultimately, the task force kept the same categories that she had in her, that the, her team had in their original report, mainly because we didn't have any sort of counterfactual yeah. data to say that's not right. Um, and, and theirs was an empirical study that ca came up with these. A different empirical study would certainly come up with different results. That's how it works, um, but. Okay. Did I see somebody before Senator Brock? Senator Pearson, did you have your hand up? Uh, I was just going to comment that, you know, the details of language seem a little in the future to me. That that there, so that's where I was. Why I wasn't engaging in, in questions. Oh, okay, Senator Brock. It was just a comment on where there may be some skepticism. Um, when Professor Colby first came uh, before the task force, uh, I noticed that she emphasized that her work was based upon what the legislature asked her to do. And in a subsequent meeting, I went back to her and said, what I heard was that you did what we told you to do, but the question is, did you do what should have been done? 
And I didn't really come, come away, and Senator Hardy may have a different opinion, I didn't really come away having come back to that question two or three times during the weeks we did this. I didn't come back with a real clear answer on that. And so that is, is always been kind of in, in the back of my mind is did we do everything that should have been done and did we use everything that perhaps we should have looked at uh, or were we narrowly focused on, on these particular areas uh, of, of, of inquiry? Uh, I, I think they, that, that what was done, I think was done well, I think it was done thoroughly. I think uh, I, I'm comfortable oh, yeah. with the, the kind of methodology that Professor Colby uh, used. Uh, uh, I, I also, of course, obviously look at the end result. We have what a 66 page bill. And I guess the only thing that we should have added is a coefficient of complexity to make it a little bit more difficult to understand. But aside from that, I, I think we did, a, we did what we could with what we had. Yeah. And I think that given what we asked the task force to do, they did way more than we asked them to do. But our primary goal was equity. And we knew the old weights weren't equitable. We knew that towns had changed and people had migrated and towns that once were fairly middle class, the jobs have gone away and they aren't that middle class anymore. But now we're doing the runs. And when you look at the impact and something seems counterintuitive, I think it, it's time, you know, I just feel the need to understand why, because I'm going to get asked why. And, um, you know, you, if Washington County may be different uh, in that we do have a couple of small cities, um, but I want to I want to make sure that we aren't disadvantaging another group of kids in trying to advantage kids in more rural communities because there are some very wealthy rural communities, um, and I think we just need to take a look and make sure that what we've done fits. You know, when we look at the reality of how it plays out, just see if that fits with what how we thought it was going to come out with the reality on the ground. And if it doesn't ask why, um, at least so we understand that. Sandra Hardy. Yeah, a couple of things. Um, the the rural um, cost difference that, that, that Professor Colby pointed to, and she'll have more details on this, is that the cost of labor and the cost of supplies um, are higher in rural areas in some cases, and our rural school districts don't have sufficient funds to um, pay that same cost. And I think you heard that from Superintendent Batsa Jordan talking about how she has a whole bunch of teachers who aren't fully licensed because she doesn't have enough resources right. to to pay for the licensed teachers. So that's one, one thing about the rural things. Um, and then there are districts that sort of get caught in the middle that are neither wealthy nor really poor. And that's certainly true um, for Addison County. Um, we get caught in the middle. Um, and I think it's somewhat true for Washington County, just sort of looking through that, um, that uh, the, the run that Brad did. And one thing about Barrie, and this is true for Addison County District, did Barrie merge Senator yes. Cummings. So the districts that merge. It was a forced <laughs> merger. Right. So because they're larger, um, they their poverty, the, the sort of poverty and in maybe inner city Barry gets less, you know, overall yep. is lower. And then yep. also their density is lower. So districts like that, that's true for a couple of my districts as well. And that's one of the main reasons why we kept the merger support grants for those districts, they would continue to get the merger support grants. And that is not in the printout that Brad did. So we could ask him to add those in so you can sort of see the extra that they would continue to get for merger support grants. So um, that was definitely a factor because they wouldn't get the weight 
they they did what they, we asked. They are, yeah, they are getting the merger. To yeah. make it more complicated locally, Barrytown just did a reappraisal and one tax bill I'm very acquainted with went up 40%. Uh, and it's took them, it usually takes at least two, it took three votes um, to pass a budget. And if their wealthier areas taxes went up anywhere near that, um, it's going to be a very interesting town meeting in Barry uh, or the, the merged school district. And it's just, it's, it's the perfect storm at this point. Um, so I just want to make sure we've dotted our I's and crossed our T's uh, and know why, why, why whatever is happening is happening. So, okay. Any other questions, comments? All right. We are ahead of schedule. We are not, our next witness is not scheduled until 3.15, right? Because we thought this would go until three and it hasn't. Um, Madam Chair, can I just yes. ask? I'm just wondering, given the silence, what other people, what other members of the committee might need to hear in order to go to the next step with this? <laughs> I think we may need to um, to start with, see if we can get some breakouts uh, on the ed fund impact of that uh, rotating or averaging per pupil. I'm assuming you guys didn't do that. The, or, the, the average, transition. the five year average, the transition. Okay. Yeah, I can talk to Brad about that. Well, uh, we'll, we'll drop Brad a note and see yeah. if he can come in and help us see how that would work on the ed fund um, and um, get a sense of how that might work. Uh, the other thing we've done is say your tax rate, you know, to, to stabilize how much that can go up. But I think it, the per pupil, which is what we're changing, um, we're gonna want to transition in. And we have got somebody from the pupil weights, uh, from the uh, director of the coalition of Vermont student for Vermont student equity is coming in and at 315. And after that, we are going back to S53. Uh, Bill Driscoll is here from AIV. We, we've asked for some, uh, testimony from what could be affected industries. Apparently there was a CPA that spoke for the chamber in the house. Um, Megan Sullivan from the chamber, it, that CPA has moved on and she's trying to find somebody else to come in and talk to us from the chamber um, and see how that, uh, that works on that one. And then we're going to walk through S-166, which is a new bill. So that's the rest of the afternoon. Are we, um, are we still anticipating some guidance from Senate Ed at this point on, on pupil waiting? We are anticipating a proposal on the English language, yes. And I know they're trying to get it out. We had a touch base this morning. Um, and I, I think it, they're looking at trying to get it out early next week. I know they couldn't get it out tomorrow, but they're trying. And as soon as we get that, we can plug that in. Um, then we can look at the, you know, then we know we're dealing with the runs with at least that we, you know, we can, we can, I think eliminate one run um, and, and then uh, one column in there and still work our way through, but we will be able to see what the impact of that decision is. 
Madam Chair, you, yes. you've repeatedly stated that we would just accept Senate Ed's recommendation as gospel. And I, I, I yes. really want, want to just say I don't I don't accept it as gospel. I will be very, very appreciative of their work and and obviously consider it. But I, I I'm not sure why we would just sort of hand over our our power in this in this case but I obviously usually, their their their, yeah. their input is is not not anything i would dismiss but no um i usually when a bill comes to us try and keep our focus on sections of the bill which are within our jurisdiction jurisdiction has been given to the ed committee to to work this one through i've been in this building long enough to know that there are no sacred cows and that we can cut up anything we feel like and i also know that anything we do will be chopped and reassembled in the other body um this is sausage making at its finest i think it's wishful thinking that you will um just do that so we can get this bill out of here. But um, I also know that you might not. So, um, but they are getting the first, the first cut at it and they might do what you think is the right thing and life might be good or life might get a lot more interesting. So, um, we will see. Senator Hardy, did you have something to say? Um, I not on that. Um, you said <laughs> good. Not at all. Um, but I just wanted to make a request to Senator Brock because um, in the the section on the audit, um, you'll see that I, as I said, put a lot more meat on the bones of that, and just want you to make sure you. I know you do this anyway, but please look through it, and and maybe we should have. The auditors and obviously AOE and people like that. Yeah, into, I, I um, think I'm going to ship this bill out to all the impacted state agencies yeah. and just ask them if they would like to comment because we've switched responsibility. We've added responsibility. Um, having been through this before, I think yeah, telling the administration they will add uh, six positions, um, probably won't get warmly received and it will send this bill to appropriations. Yeah, but, I mean, um, but that's I, something- I, We also heard- uh, from Yeah, we heard really clearly about how school districts need more support from AOE. Yeah. Um, and also to Senator Brock's point about the sort of narrowness of the study and that question that that he did kept, he asked, I think at least five times um, of Professor Colby about what would you do if you were going to redesign the whole thing? Um, that the audit is partly sort of trying to get at that question. Right. Um, so wanting to make sure the timing of it, I didn't, Jim and I went around and around on the timing of it. So that's another thing to make sure that we've got it at the right time, so. But it's important that we do this right because this is going, to be a major change. There will be some major change in some of our districts, which means we will feel major pain. Uh, some of us are still healing from the merger debates. And um, so you don't, when you, you do something this major, you, you might, you can tweak it. Um, but you don't want to be, you know, doing something major in the next year or two. Um, so I think it, it, it behooves us to make sure we've got it right. Senator Brock. Well, I, I think we did what we could with what we had, but part of the underlying thought behind the questions that I kept repeatedly asking Professor Colby and others were if you were to design a really workable education funding system, would it look like this? Well, no. <laughs> it wouldn't. It probably wouldn't. But we didn't get there. We, we, no, we didn't get no. Well, that there. isn't what we and asked her to do or paid her that, to that's, do. That's correct. We did not. And so we got what we asked for. 
Yeah. And now we've got to deal with it. So we are, yes, we are dealing with the base system we've got and we are changing one section of it, one section that never got looked at in, I think, any of our time here in the building, maybe Senator McDonald was here in the other body when they looked at weights, but we've never looked at them in my time in the, in the building. Okay, so you're getting a slightly longer than scheduled break. Thank you, Jim. Uh, that is, yeah, this one in the merger bill. <laughs> You've done your share of heavy grafting. Well, um, I, think, I think the worst for special education. That was tough. Uh, okay, I missed that <laughs> button. <laughs> but if you'd like to take a shot at appraisal, how you appraise timeshares, we'd love help. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, committee, I'll see you. Be here a few minutes before quarter after three.